Um, before we get going with the with the sermon, I was thinking again. There's a reason why I choose these words, and sometimes it's hard for me. Like, I mean, you, mo- you guys all know my background, anyways. You know, pretty rough and tumble or whatever. But whenever I hear the gospel, it like makes me cry all the time. I don't know why. So it's like it must just testify that it's the goodness of the Lord to take like a strong dude that uh, you know I've. I've had a had a a resiliency trained in just by my careers to be able to handle things and not show emotion, but yet just the simple words of the gospel, like they just tear me apart every time, which is just an amazing testimony of what it is. So even as we sing this, like come that fount of every blessing, like to actually be crying out from your heart of hearts for the blessing of God, for the fount of the blessing of God. And I think about this all the time that that Christ was given a cup. And he had to drink it, but it was a it was a limited portion. He said, "If it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done." And the and God the Father gave him the cup, the cup of His wrath, and he was forced to drink it on our behalf. But the cup that we're given to drink, it overflows from everlasting to everlasting with the founts of living water. Our cup overflows, and yet. Because Christ Jesus took the cup that was filled with wrath on our behalf, you know. And so I think about all the amazing words which just contain within this, within the context of this uh, uh, hymn of "Come, the Fount of Every Blessing," and like even like, like bind my heart with fetters, my wandering heart, like bind it to you, like bind it to you because I just have to get you. Like come, that fount of every blessing, and send angels to bring me home and get me home to my reward and whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get home to the reward, God, you do it. And for those of you that don't know what fetters are, does anybody not know what fetters are? Because it's an unfamiliar word. So fetters are actually like the shackles, the rusty shackles that would be put around your neck and put around your wrist, you know, that you would see in, in the slave trades of old and things like that. Those are what fetters are. So he's like, literally bind my wandering soul with fetters to you. Like, make me a slave to you because I have to get home and a drink from that fount of blessing, you know. So anyways, it's just always a cool word picture to to be so undone by knowing and understanding how great a debtor we are, yet he has taken these things from us. He drank the cup down to the dregs to place into our hand a cup that will overflow. It's just insane, right? So I'm always amazed by the gospel. All right, we'll get into the sermon. Because it's long, but let me pray first before we get going. Lord, I do thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be here today, God, for your people to gather, to come from different states, to come from all over the region, to gather to seek your face. It's a testimony to who you are, Lord. Who in the world is worthy to be sung to? Nobody but you, God, in your name. And so I praise you that um, you have so loved us, God, that you loved us first, even while we were enemies and even while we were strangers and even while we were sinners and even while we were alienated from you, that you relentlessly and obsessively and jealously pursued us, God. And I just thank you, Lord, that we get to gather today to seek your face, to proclaim your excellencies and learn more. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, for you to flood this place and that, um, Lord, that you would take a coal from your altar and touch my lips. I know that I'm a man of unclean lips and that you would give me the words to say as we, as we just wrestle out this next piece of scripture, God, and that our hearts would be shaped to have eyes fixed on you, Christ Jesus, as our all in all. And I pray all these things in the life-giving name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. All right, we'll get going. We're going to be in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. This is insane. Do you think we can make it happen? I doubt it. Okay. So you guys know like normally like I kind of have a rough idea how long it's going to take me because normally I have about nine pages of notes and it takes me about an hour, right, almost every week to get through that. Well, this week I have 14 pages, but I promise you I won't go over an hour because I'll just, I'll just throw pages off if we're getting too long, right? Um, so the context of our verse today, Paul talked about it last week, right? Not the Apostle Paul, the Disciple Paul. Yeah. So, so Paul talked about it last week, um, this attribute of submission, right, in this context of what 1 Peter 2 is talking about with governmental submissions. This is a hot-button topic now, 
It's always been a hot button topic for the church. That's why Peter has to address it. That's why Paul has to address it in the letters to Roman. That's why Titus has to address it. It has always, always been a hot button topic. How in the world do we operate when kingdoms collide? We have the kingdoms of this earth established by God, yet they're in willful, open defiance to God. And we have the kingdom of God of which we belong. We're monarchists, right? Like, I'm not a, I don't belong to a democratic republic. I belong to a monarchy. I have a king. Like, that's who I serve, right? So it's like, what, how do we live this out when these kingdoms collide? So this is our next context for the scriptures. And again, it's, it's very near and dear to what's going on right now. I will only be able to scratch the surface. This is one of those things where it's like, you could preach on it, you know, eight times a year and you would never fully get the context of the depth of what we're being called to with our identity in Christ. So we'll cover whatever we can do today. All right. So here's our text in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. Be subject for the Lord's sake. For whose sake? For the Lord's sake. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor, or honor the king. Some of your guys' translations will say. So then he goes on to say this. He's, so now he's going to add some more context to what he just said. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. Everybody picking up on that? He says, this is a good thing. If when you suffer unjustly, you endure under it. This is a gracious gift from God. Actually, some translation said it's to your commendation. It is commendable if you endure unjustly just because you're aware of God. Like, I'm aware of God, so you know what? I'm not going to choose to do these things. I'm going to do these things. And then even in a simplistic way, your homies mock you and scoff you and make fun of you and do whatever. You just suffered unjustly because you're conscious of God. So you have, the, you have the micro, the simple thing like that, and then you have the micro like, no, government, I'm actually not going to eat food sacrificed to idols, and I'm not going to shutter my doors. And then the Canadian mounted, Royal Mounted Police is going to come and drag you out and cordon you on the highway and drag you out of your car and handcuff you and, and throw you in jail. Why? Because I was conscious of Christ. And God says, gather his people to worship his holy name. And you're telling me I can't. So because I'm conscious of Christ, now I am suffering unjustly. And guess what the Lord says right here? He says, it is to your commendation. Does anybody know what a commendation is? Anybody? No. You don't? Paul, tell them what a commendation is. It's a war. It's a medal. It's an appointment. I used to have one. It's a medal pinned on your chest like in the military. So I say it's to your commendation. Literally, the Lord of the heaven's armies, the captain of your salvation, Christ Jesus, when he says, well done, good and serf, faithful servant, actually pins a medal upon your chest and you wear a medal just like a good soldier of Christ on your chest from everlasting to everlasting. Because you endured under unjust suffering for being conscious of Christ. So then he has this, right? This is simplest. So, so I won't break this down because this is simplest, sim, simple, right? He says, for what credit, credit is it if when you sin you're beaten for it and you endure? Like, if you did something wrong and you get punished, is it to your credit? Should you get a commendation for that? What about you kids? When you know you're wrong and you get disciplined, do you go, I want an award for getting spanked for lying to my mom? Should you get an award? No, I'm going to double spank you, Joel. <laughs> double spank you, right? No. So it says, hey, if you endure for sinning, for doing wrong, if, if, you, if you are punished or you have to suffer for doing wrong, it, it's not to your commendation. It means nothing to you, right? But it says, but if when you do good and you suffer for it and you endure it, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And here's the big deal. And this is what the Laodicean church doesn't want to deal with. For to this you have been called. 
What have you been called to? To suffer unjustly because you're conscious of Christ. You've actually been called to it. So for this, to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were strain like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseers of our souls. All right. So let's get into the text. Context real quick. I'll try to speed through this without getting hung up on it, but it's hard for me. So if I get hung up on it, somebody just say, move on. Just yell it out. Move on. Uh, the reason why the context is important is because the perversion of 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13 has strategically infiltrated our church in this particular generation like never before. Does everybody know what the perversions of this scripture are and of Romans 13 are? It's that you, you in faulty loyalty and unwavering obedience, you obey the government at all costs. Because in a perversion of these scriptures, they say God's appointed these institutions over you, and He tells you right here to subject yourselves to them. So it doesn't matter how wicked they are, it doesn't matter what they're doing, it doesn't matter what lawless edicts they're passing, it doesn't matter what they're doing to Christians and how they're persecuting, it doesn't matter, you have to be subject to them. So you just go along to get along with whatever the government says. So there's this huge perversion of the context with both 1 Peter 2, our text. And Romans 13, which is almost a mirror text written by another apostle, Paul, saying to the Romans almost the same thing that Peter is saying here. And they're a perfect overlay about being subject to rules and authorities. But there's nuances to what they're talking about. So here's the context of what Peter was actually speaking to with the scriptures. What he's not talking about is faulty loyalty to governments that are in opposition to God's law. Everybody get that? That's not what he's speaking to. What he was writing to, the background, is not to Christians who were rebelling against authorities and rebelling against governments, per se, but it was how Christians ought to rightly live in spite of the fact that at this time, when Peter was writing this letter, the non-Christians were inciting the government and the authorities to take action against them on charges of being a threat to society. That sounds like a mouthful, right? But that's actually the context for the letter. He is telling the Christians, listen, guard your behavior among the, in this hostile territory. Guard your behavior because the non-believing world is, is running to the government and trying to get them to take action against you. So don't give them any excuse. Don't give them any excuse. You, by your lives, if you're, reflecting my, if you're reflecting my kingdom and you're reflecting my decrees and my ethos and my codes of character, you should not be drawing any unjust suffering on yourself. But they're still going to anyways. So the context is actually that the non-Christians were pointing, the pagan world was pointing to the Christians and saying, law enforcement, governors, kings, rulers, go punish these Christians because they're a threat to our society. And do you know why they said they were a threat to their society? We read it all throughout Acts. We read it through John. We read it in Colossians. It's because they were saying that they were disloyal to the appointed governor, Caesar. Think about this with the Biden regime and everything like this, right? Think about this all January 6th going on. They were saying that they pose a threat to society because they lived in ways contrary to everybody else. They don't undergird LGBT. They don't undergird social justice. They're a threat to everybody. They're anti-science. They're a threat to everybody. They, wouldn't, uh, they were accused of being disloyal to Caesar. Look, they won't accept the duly elected president. These guys are they're insurrectionists. They're insurrectionists. So the people were inciting the government to come against the Christians. The government wasn't coming against them. Everybody get that? Okay, and the other thing was that they were, they were furious that the Christians were imposing, that the Christians were affecting their monetary gain by making people turn from worshiping idols by which they made money. So think about that again in the context of our culture. So this is, the, this is actually the context 
for what Peter is speaking to here when he says be subject to the authorities that are appointed over you because these people are trying to incite violence to you. They want the government to, to come against you. So you need to actually be submissive to them, not in disobedience to God, but submissive to them so that they can't fight, fault find you. Does that make sense? Is everybody tracking with the actual context of this verse? All right. So that's why in very particular, Peter chooses the word submission here and not obedience. It's, there's like 36 times where he strategically chooses the word submission. There's all kinds of Greek blah, 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 blah on why. On why this is and why he chose that. The bottom line is that it is particular where everywhere else in scripture he uses the word obedience. But with the, with the governing, ruling authorities, he chooses the word submission. The reason being is that he never had in mind Peter writing 1 Peter 2. And then Paul writing to Romans talking about submission to government. They did not have in mind a slavish, uncritical obedience to a state that was defiant against God. That's why. It's very, very particular language. And you see the same thing from the New Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. Everybody get in the context? The reason why this is important is because it's been so corrupted and perverted by the seeker-friendly church movement and by the social justice woke gospel movement and by the new apostolic reformation movement and by preterism and all these other things going on in this generation. Does anybody know what preterism is? It's this like it's kind of like this dominion type theology that we're already living in the millennial reign. Millennial reign. So Christians through man-made governments can dominate the world, can re, can take dominion back over the world through official governing institutions. But you want to talk about a flawed concept, right? The whole world lies in the evil one. Literally, the whole world lies in the evil one. But this is why they're using these things to actually pacify believers from being obedient to God and commanding them that they be obedient to governments that are opposed to God. See how perverse this is? Okay, we'll go on. Here's the other part of the context why this, why Romans 13 is being written and why 1 Peter 2 is being written. We have to have the context because it's being abused by false teachers in our generation. Is that the Christians actually were being lawless and they were using their concept of freedom in Christ to actually be for real insurrectionary towards the ruling governments. They were saying, hey, this, uh, the, the apostles are going around teaching this new thing that we're actually free and we have a new kingdom and we, so we don't, have to abide, we don't have to obey anybody. We don't have to pay taxes. And that's what it was all centered on, again, was monetary gain. Isn't it interesting that to the one, it's monetary gain, and to the Christians that want to use their no, new freedom as an excuse to be lawless, it was for monetary gain. It's all centered on the love of money. And so they said, we don't have to pay taxes. Don't pay taxes. That's what the apostles are telling us is that because of our freedom, we now are not subject to any rulers. In fact, they're subject to us. So here comes Peter going, stop it. Listen. And then you have Paul and Romans 13. He's like, stop. Listen. God does appoint rulers and authorities and governors. You need to be subject to them. You need to be submissive to them, but not blindly obedient to them, but you do need to submit to them because I love government. Government has a role. There's a reason why there's law enforcement. There's a reason why there's laws, but there's also a reason why you need to have your identity in me alone because when they oppose me, you need to be willing to stand against them, even suffer unjustly because you're conscious of me. You see how it works? Well, like overthrow the unjust well, 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 you know, there's blessed are the well, well, we'll we'll get into that as we continue to go on in this. So, the new Christians were actually using their freedom to pursue wickedness for unjust gain. Insane, right? But listen, that's the church. Like we do the same thing today, same thing all the time. So, anyways, these two concepts of the actual context are completely contrary to what the the puppet masters in the pulpits are teaching today. They're teaching blind obedience to the government for obedience sake for reasons that are actually generally monetary in, in uh, their connotation, right? All right. So here we have this great juxtaposition where the kingdom and the kingdoms, little k, are in collision all the time, right? We have this be subject, be subject to the governments, be subject to the governments, but at the same time we have 
do not love the world or the things of the world. Anybody who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Right? So it's like, okay, well, which, which one is it? We have, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Our fellowship, or what fellowship is there between light and darkness? Or what accord is there with Christ and Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with unbelievers? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And he's like, but wait, he just said, be subject to these guys, but then don't, don't have any part of this and be subject, but don't have any part and be subject. So we, so we have this collision of kingdoms and, and, it, and most of us as believers, we go, how in the world do we navigate this glorifying and honoring the Lord rightly with the right context, right? Psalm 2, the kings of the world set themselves up against God and they break off his fetters. They cast his bonds asunder and they say, we won't have this king rule over us. And it says, like, literally the kings of the earth are making war against God, and then we're told to be subjected to them. But we're told to not have anything to do with idols and no fellowship between them. How in the world do we navigate this hostile territory, right? Does everybody understand that this is the question? How do we rightly do it? How do we rightly submit, but with the true and better submission to the most high authority? So that's the question, right? There, this tension causes a carnal pendulum swing in most of us. To the one, a defiant, rebellious attitude towards all governmental institutions out from a skewed sense of faulty patriotism and self-aggrandizement. We see it, Paul and I see it all the time when we go train places, don't we? They make it, so, so the, the carnal pendulum swing is they all go over this way, like, you'll never take my guns out of my cold, dead hands. You know, like, like that kind of like faulty patriotism, like, like for America and in America and in God we trust. And I'm like, do you know in what God they trust who wrote, who put that on the back of your dollar bill? Like, do you know what God they were talking about? And like, be careful that you don't have a faulty loyalty to the nation state. Now, we should always pursue freedom in our nation, right? But we swing to this faulty thing, and it's actually a faulty patriotism and a self-puffed up in this. The other carnal pendulum swing is to the complete opposite direction, which is what this lady see in church age has done. And they have a total acquiescence to all things that are grievous to the Lord Most High. They submit to all governmental institutions out from a skewed sense of faulty loyalty and self-preservation. So the one is self-exaltation. We swing the pendulum over here. The other one, the church, with the twisting of these scriptures, is self-preservation. It's all about love of self. I will go along to get along with every lawless, grievous thing that the government puts out because, I mean, I want to keep going to work on Monday, and I got an addition I want to put on my house, and I do not want to suffer unjustly because I'm conscious of Christ. I do not want to be mocked, reviled, scoffed. I want to be all things to all people. I want to be woke, and I want a virtue signal to the world around me that I love the world and the things of the world. So you see the two pendulum swings? This is generally how we handle these, these scriptures. So the king, the king, and the kingdoms, little k, are in constant tumult, yet we have been given a very distinctive role to pay, play right smack in the middle of it. So this is the question I get all the time, all the time, on emails and on interviews and when we go speak publicly places. Jamie, what in the world are we supposed to be doing in response to the government and what they're doing right now in our nation? And you know what my response is every time? Overthrow them. Just kidding. I don't say that. I say, how the world am I supposed to know what you're supposed to do? I, how could I? I'm like, I'm a man. How could I tell you what you're supposed to do? You need to seek the face of the Lord and ask him what you're supposed to do. Because here's the deal. Look at this. Daniel. What, what nation was Daniel a slave in? Babylon. Babylon. What was Babylon? Lawless. Pagan, child sacrificing, blood drinking, mystery religion, occultic, who knows, freak show, Nephilimic, Rephaim, stuff going right. And here he is. So, so I'll go through these fast because I'll get hung. Daniel, think of the context with which these guys were operating in the governments that were over them. He was submissive, Daniel was, and he actually worked for the betterment of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, yet he was meek and boldly criminal. Did you hear me? He was boldly criminal. They said, anybody who does that is to be put to death instantly. He throws open the window so everybody could see him defy. Defy the governmental edicts. Yet he was submissive to them and working for their good. Well, uh, 
You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, good stewards of their positions, yet submissive and respectful, but they denied the laws of the land unto the death. They defied the laws of the land. Joseph, he was enslaved, yet he worked for the advancement of Egypt. Think of these good Egypt, God's most detested nation on the face of the earth ever. So lawless, so pagan, so bloodthirsty, so anti-God, it's not even funny. And yet you have God takes Joseph and he goes, boom, right smack here in the middle of Egypt. And you're actually going to, I'm going to give you so much wisdom and shrewdness. You're going to work for the betterment of Egypt. You're actually going to preserve Egypt during a time of famine. You're actually going to make Egypt, Joseph, my chosen servant, in the middle of this pagan nation, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And I'm going to use that nation for a time to preserve this little body, this little family, because I said Jesus would come through that bloodline. And I'm not lying. And I'm going to use this pagan lawless government to accomplish it. And you're going to help that government be successful. How could I tell you what you're supposed to do, right? You have Esther, endeared to king, endeared to King Artaxerxes, yet she defied him unto the death. She knew nobody could come into the presence of the king and live. If he did not hand you the scepter, you do not speak, you would be put to death. She said, I don't care. That was the law of the land, punishable by death. She said, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyways because the law of my God supersedes your law. But yet she was endeared to him. A lawless, pagan, governing king. We get this? Like, this is confusing, right? How the, so what are we supposed to do? And it goes on. Moses physically pushes against the authorities. He kills the Egyptian. He is, an, he, he is a murderer, legally. He is legally a murderer. He has broken the law, punishable by death, yet he returns to lead what would later even be called an insurrection or a rebellion against the government. And God says, that honors me. Wait a minute. Which one? Uh, uh, uh. Samson literally is subjected to the government authorities and causes the whole temple to fall down and kill them all on their head because they were like, wait, but he's working for the good, but then he's tearing one down. But then he's overthrown in his, his rebellion and insurrection, but she's endeared. But he's like, how, are we, how do we interact with these government institutions? Phineas, by what the law deemed murder, by what the law deemed murder, God deemed as righteousness. He ran the spear through the high priest and his Moabite wife. And God goes, that dude is a righteous man. The government said, that's murder. And the Pharisees and Sadducees were, that's murder punishable by death. God goes, that's righteousness. So which laws is he subjected to, right? So this is that constant tension. Nehemiah and Ezra, they worked within the confines of a pagan government, but with esteem and favor and respect. There was no rebellious or defiant posture towards their pagan overseers whatsoever. They said, can we have your favor, pagan government? Sure, you can have our favor. Why don't you go rebuild the temple? Go, thank you for your favor. We respect you, you respect us, and yet here they are under this government. They didn't say, we're going to overthrow you because you're not of God. Nope, they worked within the favor of. Then you have Paul, a Roman citizen. He applies an appeal to the laws that he was under. He actually utilized the justice system and the legal system of a pagan ruling overlord government to his benefit. He worked within the confines of, yet Paul was at the same time simultaneously civilly disobedient to him. They said, don't say this, don't say that, or we're going to kill you. And he goes, eh, is it for me to serve, to obey man rather than God? Uh-uh. Nope. If I obeyed man, I couldn't be a servant of God. Yet he uses the law and works within the law, yet he defies it at the same time, right? And it goes on. Peter in the first century church, subject to the laws, they were willingly imprisoned and entrusted to the Lord. They went to prison because they knew they were lawbreakers. We're lawbreakers. We're lawbreakers. We're lawbreakers. We're criminal. We're going to prison. Yet they were also willing to violate the law all the time. Do not have a sword. If there is a weapons ban in the Roman kingdom, if you possess a sword, it is punishable by death. It is a ban, an assault weapons ban. You guys get that? What's going on? And Jesus says, hey, do we have any swords among us? Oh, yeah, we, you're, yeah, Rabbi, we do. We have to. Okay, we're good. Hey, if anybody, like, sell everything and get a sword if you don't have one. Oh, okay. Peter, when they come to arrest Jesus in Gethsemane, draws this sword that is illegal. It is absolutely, it is a weapons ban in the state, in the nation of Rome. Not only does Christ not rebuke him for having a weapon, he commands them to have some swords among them because it is, it is the true and better natural law of God, the right to defend and to protect the innocence of life. 
So Jesus is saying, my, like, I know this is illegal. You guys are now, you're criminal. This is a criminal offense under this rule of law. But I say, and my father has said, that we love life. And we love the protection of life. And we defend life. And we uphold life. And we do these things. So I'm saying, you will be called a criminal by them, but you'll be called beloved by me. See how it works? So you have Acts 4. 8 through 20, it says, so they call it, so the, so, so the, 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 the uh, apostles are going out and they're starting to proclaim this gospel. And it says, and they called them and charged them never to, not to speak anymore at all in the name of Jesus Christ. So here's a command. Here's a legal edict. But then Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, or, yeah, sorry, I'm all, all over the place. Whether there is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. He goes on later on in Acts 5. It, it says that they were strictly charged not to teach any more in this name. And they had filled the Jerusalem with their teaching. And it says that you're trying to stir up an insurrection and a rebellion. This is what the government's saying. But Peter and the apostles answered them, we must obey God rather than men. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So here again, we have this constant... Can you open that door? It's like crazy hot. Um, you have this constant juxtaposition of how we navigate in this public display. And then here comes Christ Jesus. He is both not an either or, but a fulfillment of both. Jesus led the disciples in ways that were in direct contradiction to the laws of the land. To both Roman, civilly, and Hebraic, religiously. He was in open defiance to the laws of the land that were subjected over him as being fully man. He performed healings on the Sabbath, right? So he was, he was against the laws Hebraically. And then he commanded the disciples to have swords and did other things, which he was, he was actually acting criminally, civilly. He was acting criminally. He flips tables, which was a, an assault under legal terms, right? He literally started whipping and beating people, which is an assault legally. It is criminal activity. Yet... He willingly subject himself to the rulings of the lesser temporal carnal governing authorities unto the death. How in the world does he do both at the same time? And how in the world are we supposed to do both at the same time, right? So this is why it's a really hard, it's a really difficult thing to handle this idea of submission to governments. Like what does this look like, submission to governments? In all instances, the actions and the words and the movements of the servants of the Most High Authority are always generally deemed by the rulers of this world to be insurrectionary, rebellious, unlawful, defiant, hostile, and criminal to the kings and kingdoms to which we've been uh, placed under. Yet, we are called honorable, commendable, lawful, and full of obedience to the king and kingdom which we are representative of. So how in the world do we walk out this tension when these two kingdoms collide, right? There's a lot of nuances of government I won't get into. I have all kinds of notes about the nuances of government, biblically speaking, because most Christians don't have a good biblical perspective of government. Uh, they, again, they either swing the pendulum this way or they swing the pendulum this way. Here's the deal. God loves government. Everybody get that? He loves government. In fact, Christ Jesus it says, of his government, there will be no end. Of Christ Jesus it says, and the government is upon his shoulder. God is all about government, hence the number 12. The number 12 is perfect, divine, complete government. That's why you have the 12 nations, and that's why you have the 12 tribes, and that's why you have the 12 stones on the ephod, and that's why you have the 12 foundation stones, and that's why you have the foundation stones of, of the new Jerusalem. And everything's about 12 because God loves government. But so now here's the problem. What happens when the governments operate because of sin, because of the curse of fall, in direct opposition to God? Right? We're told that, that God uh, fixed the borders of the peoples and he numbered the nations according to the sons of God. Does everybody understand that every piece of territory on the face of the earth has a ruling principality over it? Does everybody get that? This is just straight scripture. Deuteronomy 32. Every territory on the face of the earth has a ruling entity, angelic 
uh, uh, son of God, lesser son of God, little s, uh, an Elohim that has been emplaced over them. God has given them, but he says, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted, his allotted nation. So all the nations are given. Yeah, Jacob, what's up, bro? So all, all the nations actually have a ruling principality over them. And guess what it says? And the whole world lies in the evil one. So literally every single king, ruling principality king, on the face of the earth is at warfare against God. And he goes, but Israel, the littlest scrap of land, that one's just for me. And watch what I'll do with it. I will redeem all of humanity, right? We know that Psalm 82 talks about the governments of God and the divine council, right, of the gods. There's a lot of people that go into depth about this. Dr. Michael Heiser, like, he, he breaks this stuff down um, in a gangster way, for lack of a better word. Like, it's, it's awesome, right? But, but we have this understanding of governments. Biblically, there is, it, there is a spiritual component to all governments because, because God loves it. But at the same time, we know the result of these governments is that we're told in Ephesians 6, actually, Christians, your war is not against flesh and blood. I know you think it's against the institutions of this world, but I'm telling you, it's actually against those guys that are running the institutions. It's against the principalities, the authorities, the powers, and the spiritual wickedness in high place. The war of these governments and the collision of these two kingdoms is so significant that it literally requires my armor, the armor of God, Christ, on you, covering you, in order to stand against these things. So again, this tension, how in the world do we walk in the midst thereof? At the end of the day, governments are an instrument of God, one way or the other. He is supreme, and there's not a single thing that a government can do apart from God allowing it to can calamity come upon a people unless the Lord has decreed it? Can it? No. Absolutely not. So can an, a lawless, nasty, wretched, you know, unjust government come to power unless God has allowed it to? Absolutely not. They have no power in it of themselves. But unfortunately, they're a reflection of the sins of the people. And that's what's important to know and understand. So the distinct language, or sorry, let me back up a minute. A minute. Uh, to affirm this, that even though that's true, God's purpose for governmental institutions was actually that they might restrain sin. That's why he, he loves government. Because they were supposed to be a means by which sin was restrained. Now, unfortunately, in particular to this nation and other nations throughout the word, world, the government has become institutions by which to legislate sin. So now, what in the world do we do as God's people? Let me skip through a couple things here. Where the kings of this world stand in direct opposition to the commands and the decrees and the statutes, hence the laws, right? Where they stand in direct opposition to the laws of the most high authority, of the greater magistrate, the Lord God Almighty, your allegiance and obedience to him must be a wavering. In fact, we are sternly admonished to never enter into an alliance with the lawlessness of the wicked rulers around us. Is everybody getting this? We live in the midst thereof, but we are not subjected to. We're in submission to, but we are not subjected to. We're in submission to, but we are not obedient to. I know it seems like it's double speak going on here because it is a tough, it's a tough uh, a line to tell, right? I.e., like, what do you do with the Equality Act? What do you do with abortion? What do you do with shutting your churches? What do you do with trannies reading to your kids in the public schools? What do you do with that? What do you do with mandatory vaccinations? Well, I mean, according to the seeker-friendly church, I need to obey the government in all things. And actually, I need, to, I need to go march with the LGBT movement. Because they're saying that if I say marriage is between a man and a woman, that's hate speech and I'm going to prison. I'm going to jail. I'm going to be fined $10,000. That is in the Equality Act. I am being told by the Equality Act when it gets passed that this is hate speech. And if you're found in possession of it, you are to be imprisoned for containing a Bible that says there are only two genders. Do you guys know that that's what's being legislated? So what do you do? I mean, the church told me Romans 13, obey government. It's been appointed over you. You better obey the government blindly. That's what's being taught by the pulpits now. So burn your Bible go march with the rainbow flag and undergird the dude dressed as a woman reading to your kids in school and sexualizing your children, right? That's, I mean, if you're going to be obedient to the government, then you better be obedient to the government and not be hypocritical and be double-minded. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe, right? So where, where um, we are not called to do, we are not called to enter into agreement with ruling authorities where either contractually or ideologically or spiritually they're in opposition to God, right? Isaiah 31, 1 through 3 says this, Woe to those who go down to Egypt, uh, to America, uh, to the government, to a political solution to a spiritual problem. Woe to those who go down to a political solution for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are strong. The government will help me. I'll shut out the churches because the government will help me. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult God. He speaks woe over them. Jeremiah 17 speaks, Woe, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who trusts in man-made institutions, who trusts in political ruling things to solve and fix the spiritual problem of the heart and, and whose heart turns away from the Lord, right? Woe is what the Lord speaks over us. So here, Peter is actually addressing ultimately two things by which the church can navigate the hostile territory of how in the world do we walk this thing out. He addresses two things, how to use your freedom rightly and how to submit to government rightly, but while only ever being ultimately submissive and obedient and subjected to the higher government, the higher authority, the government of King Jesus. And one thing he does affirm, just to put this this plainly, is he never affirms that you get to use the sin of your government to to allow your sin to rule and reign in you as well, too. You don't get to say the government's sinful, therefore I will exact just judgment and justice according to my own my own constructs, according to my own ideas. That is not what he says. So in answer to your questions about what do we do when they're lawless, do we go overthrow them? The Lord God Almighty is the one who overthrows them. And when he wants to move over a people to do that, it will be by the leading of the Lord and not by the carnality of the sword. It will be the divine power of God that wells up in men. And there may be physical attributes to that, right? There may be phys- physical attributes like Jezebel was literally thrown off the tower. <laughs> like there's physical things that go to Phineas physically did things, right? Samson physically eradicated the government of the Philistines. Sometimes there's physical attributes, but it, when it's done by the Spirit of God, it will be to the glory of God, it will be to the redemption of humanity, and it will be to the saving of souls. So here's why it, what it's all centered on. I gotta skip through some of my notes here. That what the scriptures are pointing to all throughout scripture, what Jesus was speaking to, what the epistles is speaking to in the scriptures is how to operate out from a lens in the land of the living when these two two things collide, when these two kingdoms collide, unto a means that is only ever redemptive. That's what it's what they're speaking to. That's what it's about is is it redemptive? If you suffer unjustly because you're conscious of God, it, it is to your commendation, but pay attention that they're watching and it's to redemptive. If I put Daniel in Babylon, it's, to the, it's because it's redemptive. And if I put Joseph in Egypt, it's because it's redemptive. And if I call Esther here, it's because it's redemptive. And if I have Samson uh, uh, collapse the whole government structure in one foul swoop, it's because it's redemptive. And all things, it's all about the redemption of the souls of men and the proclaiming of the excellencies of God, right? This is what has eternal value and weight. It's not about jurisprudence, and it's not about civil structures, and it's not about commands and decrees. It's about redemption, redemption, redemption. Therefore, we do have to reject any of the perverse leanings of Romans 13 or 1 Peter 2 to make it about blind obedience at the end of the day, right? So I'll touch on this real quick before we move on. Why is there so much confusion about how to walk this out? which is very unique to America that we have confusion about how to walk this out. Why is there so much confusion about what it looks like to be obedient to government but ultimately obedient to God? Like, why is this like, this shouldn't be confusing, right? It's like, yeah, we obey. Like, I want to pay taxes and I want nice roads and I like fire police and EMS. Like, that would be foolish to say, no, I'm not going to pay my taxes. IRS comes swat to my door. Like, it makes sense, like, to have speed limits and laws and, like, government is good and laws are good. And, but how could we take that next intellectual leap and say, but I'm going to obey the government when it is willfully defiant against God's created order? Well, have you guys ever heard of clergy response teams? 
Have you guys ever heard of angels masquerading as ministers of righteousness, but they're actually Lucifer? Have you ever heard about the secret doctrines of demons working their way into the church and bringing the way of truth into disrepute? Have you ever heard of the, the Marxist communist church movement that is the gospel coalition and like the Southern Baptist Convention? There's a reason why there's confusion in the church right now. It's because there's a war for your understanding. Because the governments of the world are adamantly hostile towards God so the church is being strategically conditioned to serve the governments of men rather than the government of God. Does that make sense? It's by design. That's why there's confusion. There shouldn't be any. It's simple, right? Like, I'll obey government until they go against God. And then I can't. I can't. Like, it's not for me to serve you rather than God. Sorry, I have to be obedient. You're telling me not to talk about the gospel of life? You're telling me not to hold out the word of truth that sets dead men free? You're telling me not to protect these children that are being sexualized by these things? Like, I'm, I'm sorry, put me in prison. It's not for me to serve man rather than God. I have to serve God, right? There shouldn't be this confusion about these things, but there is. And the other reason why is because there's actually enemies within. The love of money and the love of comfort. The love of money is the root of all evil. The reason why the church loves to pervert these scriptures is because the church loves money. They want to be all things to all people. They do not want to have their 501c3 status removed. They do not want their comfort of living reduced. A pastor who has a $300,000 house mortgage or $350,000 house mortgage does not want his congregation to be cut in half and him have to go live in a $100,000 house. It's the love of money. That's why they say, hey, just listen, whatever the government tells us to do, let's just do it. Let's just do it because I do not want to go to jail because I have a really good life. But then you got a guy like John MacArthur that's like, bring it on. You have these other pastors I've seen that have racked up like, what is it, like $900,000 in church fines. They're like, don't gather your church together or we're going to fine you. He's like, hey, church, welcome back Sunday. $10,000 next week. Don't have church or we're going to fine you. Hey, guys, it's good to see you again. Let's come seek the face of $10,000. He's spending $10,000 a week to get the church to just come together and seek the Lord faithfully, right? He doesn't care. So he does not care about the money versus those who do care about the money. All right. So here's what Jesus says in the fullness of the scriptures. And this is the biggest thing, and really it should have been its own sermon. That the Lord has never required of us blind, ignorant obedience to the government systems of this world, but only ever an entrusted, an entrusted, circle it, an entrusted obedience to the will and wisdom as elect exiles in it and entrusted obedience. And Christ Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Are we getting that? Christ Jesus is the true and better example of how to navigate obedience to the government in this hostile territory. The posture of those who operate in this hostile territory is submission to those who have been appointed over them, yet entrusted obedience to the one in authority over it all. No matter how much you're marginalized, you're reviled, you're unjustly, you're unjustly punished, and ultimately, no matter how much you are criminalized. You are a criminal in this nation, almost, almost there. You will be a criminal just for saying that marriage is between a man and a woman. So you better start thinking and acting like a criminal because you have been deemed a criminal, right? It's like there's always a criminally minded thing. Like, well, I guess I'm a criminal, so I guess I'll operate out from, out from that posture in a way that's obedience to my Lord, but criminalized by them, right? So herein we have the heavenly mic drop right here. It starts in verse 9. This is the heavenly mic drop. For it is commendable if somebody bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of Christ. Commendable, commendable, commendable. He goes on, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? He goes, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they reviled him, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Mic drop. And trusting himself to the one who judges justly. That's the example that you follow. Hebrews 7, Hebrews 5, 7 through 10. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, 
He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Submission to who? To the Romans? To the Pharisees? To the Sadducees? Why was he heard? His submission to who? To the Father! Exactly! He was heard because of his submission to the Father. I'm going to entrust the one who judges justly no matter what they do to me. No matter what they bring against me. I don't have to revile back. I don't have to overthrow back. I don't have to assault back. I don't have to tear down back. I, will, I, I am entrusted to the one who judges justly. I will offer up my prayers and petitions without Christ to him, and I will be heard because I'm submitted to him, not to them. That's how I walk and navigate in this hostile territory. It's out from a greater obedience. It's out from a bigger submission, the true and better submission to the Lord God Most High. Christ Jesus was subject to the things on this earth, even the governments of this earth, unto the death. He was actually subjected to them unto the death, unjustly. Yet, it was because he was actually entrusted to the one who does judge justly. And forever, from everlasting to everlasting, he is the true and better high priest and the true and better example. And he has received all glory and honor from the Father because of it. Right? It's, this is the reality of what we're called into in this, in this day and age. So how do we rightly submit to those appointed over us, yet rightly defy their laws and their offenses, their offensive acts against our holy judge? The bottom line is, I don't care if they call me criminal. And I don't care if, if they, if they want to stick me in prison, and I don't care if they strip me of everything, because I know the true and better judge pins the medal upon my chest, right? And mark my words, the more conscious you become of God, the more you will suffer for Christ. Is everybody aware of that? There's an inverse relationship. The more godly you become, the more you're going to be persecuted. The more godly you become, the more the world's going to hate you. The more conscious you are of Christ, the more the world around you will utterly reject you. And the more conscious you are of Christ, the more you're actually going to be tormented in your righteous soul. Just like Lot was by the lawless deeds that you see in here in the city. You will actually suffer in your soul the more conscious you become of Christ. As you look at the world around you going, what the world is going on, God? I'm tormented in my soul. I'm suffering in my soul. I'm suffering in my soul because of the injustice of the world. And he's like, now you're being unified with my son. Can you imagine what he saw? Can you imagine what he felt? And this is commendable for you to do this thing, right? So here it is. One day when it's all said and done, and I, as an individual, and you as brothers and sisters in Christ, have overcome without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Right? It's Philippians 1. When you have overcome without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, you will be sat by the Father at the right hand next to the Son, just as He overcame and sat down to the Father's right hand. Just as Jesus will, son, will one day soon hand over all the unjust kingdoms of the world to His Father. He goes here. He says He's going to gather the kingdoms of the world, the governments of the world, the institutions of the world. He's going to give it to His Father. So too, He goes, he goes in return, you who suffered unjustly, I'm going to take those same kingdoms and I'm going to hand them back to you and you're going to rule and reign over them. Are we getting this? Like, you can suffer unjustly in these crazy governmental systems while being obedient to God, even unto the death if it's necessary of you, because one day he's actually going to hand those kingdoms right back to you and say, now you get to rule and reign over them justly. And here's the good thing. You won't do it out from a vindication or from a malice or from a retribution, but you will do it out from a fullness of understanding of justice and judgment and mercy and goodness because you'll have the fullness of how God loves and needs and uses governments to rule the people unto redemption. That's why. So our identity, again, has to be in Christ alone. When John the Baptist introduced Jesus... He did not speak of him as the one who was going to overthrow Rome. Everybody get that? He didn't say, hey, this is your Messiah who's going to overthrow Rome. That's what they, the people thought, right? That's what they were expecting. That's what Nar is teaching now. The people of God are going to be the ones to overthrow Rome. The, this is what the, the social justice movement is about. You, through your social justice actions, can actually change Rome. That's not what John the Baptist said about Jesus. When Don, John the Baptist introduced Jesus... He said, he is the one who's going to take away the sins of the whole world. That 
is the perspective out from which we navigate this hostile territory. The redemption of the sin of humanity, not the overthrow of government institutions, not even the changing of government institutions, but the redemption of the sins of the whole world through the professing of the testimony of Christ Jesus and the sufficiency of his blood, right? This, then, is the right lens through which we view our role in submission to governments. Not in the carnal pendulum swing and of this collision of kingdoms, but through the forgiveness of sins, through commendable suffering and in obedience to the Lord. That's why, like the heroes of old, and like the heroes of the faith of old, and like these, some of these names that we've already gone through, we can be submitted, but not passive. We can be meek, but not enslaved. We can be in the midst of, but not a part of. We can be a subject of, but not subjected to, right? We can be innocent, yet be called criminals and reviled by these governments around us. We can be righteous, yet be deemed insurrectionary. We can be dutiful to our Lord and King, yet prosecuted for rebellion in the land of the living. We can be entrusted to the Lord God Almighty, and yet be in defiant of these governments over us. This is how we rightly navigate. Why? Because of our true and better allegiance, by true and better submission to the true and better judge who impose the true and better perfect justice once and for all time. That's why. By being entrusted to the one who judges justly. It's the only way to navigate this sycophant, hostile world in which these governments are imposed over us. It's the only way, right? Political freedom is desirable. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, like, I fought for freedom, right? Some of us in here fought for, like, political freedom is desirable, and it should be continued to be contended for. You should engage the public sphere, not withdraw from it, because you carry inside you the words of truth and the words of life and an eternal morality and the true and better justice and the true and better. You ought to contend for freedom in every way that you can possibly contend for freedom. But freedom from sin and freedom from the sin and the curse and death is what is the ultimate pursuit of our lives in the land of living. The joy of a perfect liberty-infused government will be known one day. That's the lens from which, out from which we navigate this hostile territory. And the true and better government under which we have been bought, the government of King Jesus, and of the greatness of this government and his peace, we are told there will be no end. That's the government that we longingly look for. That's the true and gov better government that we submit to. And that's the lens from which we obey the government institutions of the world to the degree that it is not offense against our King Jesus. The end.